there is a disproportion, so I'm looking where should I <laughs> direct my... Um, so good morning, uh, good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues. Uh, on uh, behalf of the uh, Riga Graduate School of Law, uh, I would like to welcome you as well uh, to the school and uh, already at the start to extend my, my thanks and, and gratitude to Valid for uh, sort of, you know, working on this project. Uh, and as we heard, that there will be a continuation to the issues that uh, we are going to discuss. Now, um, just before uh, taking uh, the podium, I was actually uh, looking at the overall uh, title of uh, our Jean Monnet uh, project, and I thought to myself, hmm, you know, you notice the fundamental rights uh, part was at the end of the project title. And I thought, hmm, no, probably it should have been at the beginning. And then we talk about the competition and uh, the big data or uh, data um, at large. So given uh, uh, that uh, I have been um, involved um, both teaching and practicing human rights for more than uh, 20 years by now, of course, uh, my task today is to talk to you about the bigger picture, and that bigger picture are the fundamental rights, using the terminology of the European Union law. But uh, I will often slip into using the term human rights. Um, we are all uh, here, um, probably uh, citizens of the states that have uh, democratic legal order, uh, the rule of law states. And uh, in democratic uh, rule of law state, um, by definition, uh, the task of the state is to protect individual rights and freedoms. And of course, what we are saying uh, from the perspective of business, and with the development of all the new technologies, that some of the uh, values that our societies nowadays are based on, and that you have grown up with, we have fought for, uh, at least in Latvia, that some of these basic values are being challenged. And that is what I would like uh, all of you specialized in uh, uh, in, in competition law, in business law, in uh, the uh, uh, issues that have to do with digital economy. I would really like, I'm probably one of the few speakers uh, that will address uh, this tension, uh, the, the current tension that we have between our value system, the worldview that we are uh, used to, and uh, the demands and the interests of uh, digital economy. And I think we should not forget about it, uh, and we should be able to, um, well, to, in a way, uh, not probably during uh, these two days, but uh, the, the, the possibility to deal with this tension, to find ways to address this, I think uh, is uh, an imperative one. Uh, not to not to not to mention that of course the uh, uh, Court of Justice of the European Union is uh, heavily implicated uh, in this matter, and so uh, are in fact the highest national jurisdictions, uh, including uh, the Latvian Constitutional Court. But I'm not speaking in the capacity in that other capacity here. I would like to speak freely. Uh, although the Constitutional Court recently, a year ago, has rendered uh, an important uh, judgment on, uh, on data protection. Now, uh, throughout my presentation, I will <clears throat> reflect on three main themes. But they are not separated, because it's very difficult to separate. They will be, there will be a uh, uh, sort of mix of, uh, of reflections along these three themes. First, the changing nature of the right to privacy uh, insofar as it concerns uh, the protection of personal data because that's the elephant in the room. 
secondly, I will, I cannot avoid it, uh, I will refer uh, a little bit uh, to the business interests in data collection, and that's what most of you will be talking about. But I will place uh, my few reflections uh, in the context of the right to privacy and data protection. And thirdly, I will uh, really ask the main question about the role of law, uh, legal regulation in the digital age uh, that we live in, and uh, uh, how um, or in what way the legal regulation uh, deals with or could deal with the challenges uh, posed to, as I mentioned already, uh, posed to the uh, established values in democratic societies, uh, certainly in, in, in Western uh, Hemisphere, um, how the, the role or what role should the, the, uh, the law have in uh, sort of trying the, to find the new balance, which is evidently the, something that we are uh, looking uh, into. Now, there is no question, and I'm absolutely not critical or skeptical about it, uh, there is no question that the digital age uh, opens up, has opened up uh, incredible uh, possibilities. Um, but, uh, and I believe some of that will come out uh, during the two days, the uh, digital age has also shown to us by now the uh, new risks that probably when these technologies started to develop, we really had no clue about. Um, we also know that uh, as we speak, uh, the data are produced. I mean, you are now probably, unless you have phones really switched off, um, you are producing data um, uh, of uh, an incredible amount and uh, at a speed that, you know, is very difficult, in fact, to grasp. Uh, furthermore, um, at the start of the technological era, uh, we were still within the classical sort of relationship of public authorities, the state retaining and having capacity, of course, to retain our data. Today, this has completely changed and the law has a very difficult task to juggle with it because I think states are no longer the main data retainers. We could probably name a few of the big national or multinational which is even more interesting, private law entities that are dealing with our data. Legally, this is a whole different story because from the, within a democratic rule of law based society, the relationship between an individual and a state is certainly determined by human rights law principles. Now, what we do in the horizontal relationship, namely between a private entity, which is an individual, and a private law legal person, with often more budget and means than a state, certainly the one we are in here today. So, and that, I must say, poor, vulnerable <laughs> individual. So. What are the roles? How have the roles changed? And what's the responsibility of the state? It is a lot about the responsibility, already sort of jumping to the, the point on where to strike um, uh, a right new, uh, new balance. Um, also, uh, individuals, every one of us in this room and outside, we actually approach um, the data that we own uh, very differently, each one of us. Um, I would say that um, over the decades, uh, having been a dinosaur from the pre-digital age, <laughs> I have seen how, um, and having the fun of having young children, <laughs> I see how the behavior 
of the individuals has changed. And so you have this uh, incredible society of the dinosaurs, like myself, and the young, young people who, in fact, do not much care about their privacy. The question is, do they understand that they should care about their privacy? Mm -hmm. And that is also an issue that one uh, that is part of, I think, um, a solution. Many commentators, I just like that uh, concept, many commentators talk about the existence of uh, so-called uh, privacy paradox, sort of a common concept that, uh, that, that uh, you will see in, uh, in, in um, expert writings. And they define privacy, uh, privacy paradox, paradox as follows. Uh, while most individuals claim to be concerned about their privacy and are aware of that, I belong to that category, by uh, using uh, digital uh, technologies, at the same time they are providing a vast amount of personal data in practice to uh, sad parties. And they do take very few steps to counteract this, uh, the perceived threat that the sharing of the data um, may involve. So you have at the level of kind of, uh, of declarations, you have many people who say, I care about my privacy, but in real life, I mean, suddenly you want to look for something in Google and you off you go. Uh, now, um, for any regulation uh, that we are trying to conceive of, and the EU's uh, data protection regulation is that attempt, in fact, one of the recent ones of the new balancing, right? But uh, in order for us to uh, meaningfully reflect on, on regulation that takes note of new realities, we really have to understand the new behavior of the individuals and the society. Because you know the, the very purpose of law is, what does the law do? It takes stock of what the society wants. People generate the idea. We think this idea brings us forward, brings the progress, the welfare, of course. And the law's task is to normativize that, to give a normative frame to that idea. And so all of our discussion of the ups and downs of the digital age, in fact, they must result in re legal regulation that is best suited to take stock of these ideas and actually be the basis for the further development. And so that's how your program, uh, conference program is also sort of uh, organized in that way. Um, now, um, the uh, uh, identified uh, privacy paradox where individual kind of think at one level, act at another level, really uh, uh, represents uh, a dilemma for legal regulation, and that's in fact a tension, because uh, we are not quite sure how to delimit the scope and content of data protection. Because the human being doesn't know it itself, himself or herself. <laughs> now, in the digital age, uh, a few sort of um, thoughts on, on this. In the digital age, um, we can uh, profile um, individuals um, by the um, very fact that, uh, you know, when you sort of search for some information, when you Google something, that produces information on your interests, on your taste, um, on your uh, 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 travel interests, sort of physical symptoms if you check the medical sites. Now, all of this information, and people don't realize it actually, not sort of you specifically, but that information, of course, is collected, is processed, 
And uh, as you will be discussing that, the whole economic activity is based on the access to this type of personal data. Now, uh, which, in fact, uh, the, uh, the, the, this, the, uh, this type of act, uh, economic activity, the uh, digital ec uh, economy, is dependent on all of uh, the data that people rather carelessly sort of let into the, uh, uh, well, into the virtual space, uh, I, should, I should say. Um, that's exactly what you will be discussing when it comes to the uh, big data. Uh, I will not be, uh, uh, I, I will not specifically uh, uh, talk um, on on that. But it, it is a big, big um, issue. The reason is because at the level of constitutional documents, both of European Union, and that's the Charter of Fundamental Rights and also at the level of the national constitutions, certainly of the Western sort of cultural affiliation, I should say. The uh, right to privacy, which has for quite some time, since we know the phenomena, also covered personal data, that constitutional right has not been abolished. And there is certainly, well, I have not heard it. I'll share with you some of the in-house talks uh, in the European Court of Human Rights, where I was the judge before, but uh, a little later. So at the constitutional level, there is absolutely no uh, uh, discussion of giving up the right to privacy, including protection of personal data. And as we know, the uh, definition which the EU uh, data regulation has uh, sort of taken over and that sort of stands uh, for what's it, what, what it is worth, that personal data are such data uh, whereby we can or the person has been identified already or we can identify the person. So that's uh, roughly the um, uh, uh, definition. Um, as I mentioned already, um, the EU data uh, regulation, and I am sort of professionally um, and personally <laughs> uh, pleased with uh, the outcome uh, of those very, very difficult negotiations. Um, and I will mention to you why I think EU data regulation um, has an important role, in fact, uh, to play in finding the balance in this tension between the right to privacy and the protection of personal data and all of the uh, ideas and interests that the same people have on how to use the data for progress and for, for, for uh, the benefit, um, welfare benefit of the, of the society. Um, now, so far within a rule of law based societies, uh, an interference with a fundamental right, including the right to privacy, was assessed based on a strict methodology. Now, that methodology is the following. The interference uh, needs to be, first of all, identified. It is very clear that any data processing is an interference with the right to privacy. There is no even question. So methodologically, if, we, if I was a judge, which I am, when I have a case of data processing that someone is unhappy about, I would determine interference with a human right. Then, doesn't mean it's wrong. So where do we go then? Um, the judge would look whether uh, that interference, whether that data processing had a legitimate aim. Hmm. I have to tell you that you might have in your sort of area of law or business ideas about what legitimate aims have. However, we are assessing interference with the right to, uh, to privacy within a constitutional context. And within a constitutional context, you have very limited, strictly defined legitimate aims, which permit authorities 
to interfere with right to privacy, which permit the authorities to process data. And I'm still talking about the data that is processed by public authority. I'm not yet talking about private law legal person. But we, we will try to establish where the legitimate aim that the legislator has established for allowing the interference with the right to privacy, any judge in a democratic state will be looking at the legislator's choice and whether that has been complied with. Then, of course, and that's the crux of the matter, even if we have a legitimate aim for data processing, uh, for example, national security, which allows a number of uh, more relaxed approaches to data processing, uh, we would still look whether the interference with your data was proportionate. And it is this where the solution of uh, the case lies. And I can tell you that all of the courts nowadays, because the legal regulation is sort of say changing, I would say, oh, and, and ideas are changing and we are still grasping with the ideas, but the judge has to apply law now. And one of the biggest challenges for the judges, especially in the countries like Germany, like France, is really the fact that they ought to know what the law is, even when no one else maybe knows, and they have to solve the proportionality issue in that particular case. Now, mind you, also the Latvian Supreme Court has been faced uh, with these cases, and just uh, from a recent uh, con human rights conference that the RGSL had a couple of weeks ago, the approach of the uh, Supreme Court is to see, uh, sort of within the administrative proceedings, to protect the access to information, which is yet another aspect in this tension where we have already tension between two constitutionally protected rights. So you, have a, you really have a plurality of dimensions, and that's what I would like to simply you to keep that in perspective. Now, <clears throat> I would like to, here to give you a, a concrete example. We are confronted with, with this every day, uh, and I like using examples of banks and financial institutions. I will not give you the re uh, openly the reasons why. <laughs> now, the bank. In the Latvian legal system, banks, private law, legal entities, are obliged by the regulation of the parliament to collect a very interesting information from their customers. And the information is following. You are periodically asked to answer a questionnaire where you have to state, are you a politically responsible person? And that is defined, so uh, if you are a judge, interestingly enough, you are a politically responsible person. I saw it only constitutionally, but turns out politically. Right, when you click you are, then you are asked the question, uh, on average, how much do you, uh, how, how much income do you have monthly? But the, most interestingly, you are also asked the question, how much on average you spend a month? And then you, ask, ask, uh, you are asked the question, why? I can disclose, um, I answered that question, that, why do I spend as much as I indicated? I answered the question for a living. No one has called me yet. Now, but this is um, uh, this kind of information. It's interesting in a big data context, right? Because what that information tells the bank or any financial institution you are asked to submit this information. Beyond your name and, and, and surname and your uh, ID, etc., it definitely tells the financial institutions about your habits. 
And then you can ask yourself a question, are you by any chance receiving interesting newsletters from the bank? Are you by any chance receiving very targeted information from your banks? I am, suddenly. Now, the uh, answer to uh, this particular example is sort of in defense of this approach is that, well, you know, people know why they have to answer this, these questions, they consent to it. Have you asked the question, what happens when you would not want to consent and when you wouldn't want to submit this questionnaire? There is no real consent, is there? And that is a fundamental issue one should discuss when we talk about protection of data and use of data. Now, there is, of course, so we have an interference with the right to privacy in each of these situations. The financial institutions in this type of scenario interfere with your data. They do it lawfully because, the, at least in this country, the uh, lawmakers have asked the banks to do that. There is a legitimate aim. You know that the aim is the law on the prevention of uh, money laundering, etc. That's a sort of national security public order issue par excellence. Yes, uh, there is a, um, a legitimate aim. But uh, the question is, is it proportionate? The questionnaires, I bet, I haven't done a comparative study, I wouldn't be in a position to, but I bet they differ from one bank to another. And now comes the question, you know, which of the models is more sort of balanced and which clearly is probably too much? It is a question of proportionality it is very clear that also these big private law legal persons, similar to any other public authority, have to be able to justify their execution of the law in terms of proportionality test. Have they thought about it? Maybe there are some lawyers from the banks. I do not know. I have my doubts. Um, in terms of uh, proportionality, the following factors will play a role. I mean, for the moment, the law is like that, and EU data regulation makes a point of it. You've, of course, you, they have to ask for your consent. So you click, yes, please take my questionnaire, my answers. We discussed the, how real that consent is. So the consent, uh, it, it is part of the assessment of the proportionality of the interference. You would also now, you would also now uh, look at, uh, and that's thanks to the EU data regulation, um, you would look at privacy policies posted on all of those requesting your data. That's part of proportionality analysis. Is it explained in advance? basically. Are you an informed submitter of your data? And that is constitutionally, that is very important. It is very important what these privacy policies state, for what purpose, in what amount, for how long this data will be stored. Um, my doubts are that for example, in the, uh, this uh, anti-money uh, laundering uh, context, that the data of our habits, basically, that have been submitted, I don't think we have been informed how long this particular data is going to stay with the financial institutions. So there is, there is uh, um, um, a uh, difficulty uh, there. Now, since Valid, is telling me that I should be finishing in one minute. I have to now uh, take out uh, several points uh, of my presentation. You will have a chance maybe to ask some questions. But we have gone through uh, the uh, examination of the interference with the right to privacy 
uh, in so far as uh, data processing uh, is uh, concerned. Now, a few final comments on the big issue. You see, um, at the European Court of Human Rights, we did have, about 10 years ago, we actually, at some point, ask ourselves a question, whether the right to privacy, or the data protection specifically, is something that we still want to have as a fundamental right. That's off the record, because that should not be leaving that it's the European Court of Human Rights that has been. But human rights lawyers are also very pragmatic lawyers. Um, there, this, of course, has not uh, left uh, you know, the, the court. Uh, I'm just um, uh, sharing uh, it with you. And having further reflected in the context of the conference we are having right now on this issue, um, I would say the following. Um, I think the answer is no. I think the way the, 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 the Western, certainly, societies value privacy has become so, so ingrained as to who we are, our identity. Privacy is part of creativity, as you know. For us to create ideas, it's different in different societies. I've seen all sorts of <laughs> things in my life, and especially on privacy, we differ quite a bit around the planet. But uh, as far as I sort of have a sense for Europe, and probably North America and Canada, um, the privacy is space and privacy is important. It's conducive for creation, for work. So I have doubts that at the level even of ideas that we generate, we would be willing and that it is good for progress to somehow sort of give up or jeopardize this value. So that's my first reflection. My second one is, so that means, if I'm right, <laughs> that means that we will have to continue juggling with this tension for quite a bit. And that the EU data protection regulation is just the first step. It simply sums up what we have achieved so far. It has a number of good safeguards, such as the control of the data holder, data owner, a better control of where the data are and what happens. It Also, uh, the possibility to withdraw your data to, well, to be forgotten. That's why EU court decided the way it decided. It's very important. So we, are, we continue working on safeguards, and we are testing just how far human mind is ready to accept the development of technologies so that these technologies would not become dangerous to the human race. And that's where we are. And I thank you for your attention. Hi, thanks very much for an interesting presentation. I'm Lisa Altman Rich and I work in health insurance and looking forward to presenting uh, tomorrow at the conference as well. I was really interested in what you said about proportionality and the data privacy paradox. And do you think there's a way that maybe we could use proportionality to help solve the data privacy paradox or going some way to in terms of if companies could actually explain or institutions could explain how their collection of data is proportional, this could actually help educate people to think, do I want to be sharing that sort of data? Yes, uh, I think that is the way forward. In fact, uh, I think that's the whole idea of the EU data protection regulation, uh, which sort of I mentioned a few. Uh, the, uh, the part of the, uh, maybe not uh, you know very far uh, forward uh, uh, not very long term but for the moment what we have come to realize that that really we need to communicate better well starting with the kids of course so that's an, a very important element we need to communicate better on these risks in fact that are inherent in each one of us it's a value but we are very careless about the value 
So it's a question of mutual you know, information. Uh, we should inform ourselves. Uh, we should inform the others. And yes, I agree with you. Um, the, uh, those uh, with the means and the, the, the power and the responsibility to collect the data, they are in particular responsible to explain the risks so that the gap between the ideal and the real would be brought closer, right? Um, I would say the, the, the banks are very much, uh, should be, well, themselves understand this, this whole business and uh, should tell the people, <laughs> the clients, uh, as well as sort of your, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the health institutions, that's a very, uh, especially with the sensitive data, that is particularly important. So in other words, um, it is the shared responsibility of everyone, for sure, and uh, it is 21st century, is the age of communication with all of the digital means. It is a question of transparency, communication, honesty. And that would be part of the, of the proportionality. Uh, that's there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the speech. Um, I have a question also about relative to proportionality. How do you think should we deal with the fact that this point of balance uh, is changing very fast actually together with the introduction of new technologies and it's really happening very fast. Yeah, but usually it is judicial power that is that sets this balance. Yeah. And it takes sometimes longer time uh, for judicial power to make decision while you will go through all of the uh, stages. Uh, of, the, of the courts, how should we deal with the fact that technologies and balance may change faster than we can get some kind of public uh, opinion uh, <clears throat> about what is this point of balance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that question, um, I can tell you, within the context of uh, European judicial dialogue, uh, I mean, nowadays there is uh, uh, another sort of phenomena that is growing whereby uh, courts, uh, the highest courts and European courts, are really sort of in touch on, on very regular basis. And we have, in fact, discussed this issue because we realized that uh, justice can be slow uh, compared to the development of technologies. There is a total disbalance. That, uh, that I accept. However, however, in fact, having reflected on this issue, I would say the following. Uh, by and large, if we do not give up the value of privacy, and if we do know that data processing is what it is, it is an interference with uh, privacy, and if those um, entitled to process data behave responsibly, and in fact, knowing all of these risks, communicate with the uh, well, with the industry, with with the uh, private individuals uh, accordingly. Then this um, uh, difficulty, I would not exaggerate it. I actually would not exaggerate because, by and large, at least sort of the the developed legal systems have elements to offer already. I mean, while you await the proceedings to just be you know confirmed in your opinion or while you are trying to deal uh, with, the, uh, with this, uh, the, the, the privacy uh, paradox. So I would not exaggerate it. The judiciary is aware, but I would not exaggerate it. And um, finally, um, well, like the, the, the world history shows, you have inventions that, of course, um, in the end of the day, uh, have proved to be absolutely counterproductive to the development of the society or the, the, the whole human race. And these technologies have been there, they have been put in practice, and it is only afterwards, unfortunately, that the people have realized we have, have to try to abolish it or legally abolish it. Let's take uh, international humanitarian law. Let's take, the, for example, the arms, different types of technologies. They will be tested until the law says it's prohibited. And nuclear arms, we still have not managed to fully prohibit, you see. So this, this, is, this is how you know, society, innovation, law interacts. We cannot you know, say, well, you should not stop inventing until the judge has kind of approved. That won't happen. That's not how we have done it so far. I don't think we need to. But I would say, once the legislator has legislated, the judge has ruled, 
that's the, the violation of human dignity because that's what we are heading to. You know, there are some of the innovations that can go against not just the privacy, but human dignity is a very, it's a main value that we have. And if that is trespassed, I would say every jurisdiction will say that's not allowed. That's very quickly. We could probably give a class on it. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much, Ineta. Thank you very much.